It's with a great deal of pleasure that, and his topic for tonight is why he's a democratic socialist. So let's give a warm greeting uh, to Mark Hendrickson. Well, I'm grateful to be here tonight as a representative spokesman of our revolution, Oklahoma. I have pursued the ideas of democratic socialism for 40 years. I want to explain what that means to me and why I believe it is the only platform by which we may hope to save our country's freedom and democracy. For decades, those of us on the left have been calling ourselves progressives. We do that because right-wing propaganda succeeded in making the term liberal a pejorative term. Acknowledging that consultants and media masters do not want the left to use the term liberal, then why do I articulate the need to be openly democratic socialist in our platform? Our nation is weary of those who are inauthentic and they will support those of us who justify our position with facts and arguments. In his post-campaign memoir, Our Revolution, Senator Bernie Sanders said that he had won the support of millennials but that he had failed to garner a lot of support from his own generation. And he attributed that to the fact that boomers came of age in a time of worldwide polarization when our enemy was godless communism. He suggested that the word socialism was frightening to older Americans. Like many of you, I am of an age when in my elementary school and junior high school preparation, we would be given drills to protect us against the godless communists and we would be urged to hunker down under our desks so that that little thin layer of formica would somehow give us some sort of <laughs> protection from the oncoming atomic blast. The first thing we know about democratic socialism is contained in the adjective. It is a democratic process. My first thesis tonight is that every election is fundamentally about two questions. The first is what role will the public sector play each year in regulating the markets? And the second question is how much will we pay each year to su sustain the American empire? I suggest to you that the other topics which tend to dominate the debates are really distractive noise. Of course, like everyone in this room, I hold strong views about abortion, choice, LGBTQ rights, gun control, etc. But those are issues by which the right-wing propaganda machine has coerced millions of Americans to vote against their own economic self-interest. Yes, the left needs to stand strong against institutional discrimination. The Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 are among the great achievements of this nation. But the left must be more than a collection of citizens for which we engage in a bidding war as to which group's grievance is most immediately in need of a remedy. The advantage of a platform of democratic socialism is that it provides a basis for a good life for everyone. Through democratic socialism, at each electoral cycle, the citizens have the opportunity to reduce or increase the public sector's role in protecting ordinary Americans from the effects of an unregulated free market economy. 
Democratic socialism acknowledges that people who work hard and save should be the principal beneficiaries of their industry and thrift. And we do not support the common ownership of the means of production. The first question to address is this. Is America in 2018 a capitalist nation? Recently, the French sociologist Thomas Piketty published a bestseller called Capital, which researched public records in North America and Europe and came to the not surprising conclusion that historically, free market economies have caused the aggregation of wealth in the hands of an aristocratic elite, what we call the 1% in this country. His book is interesting, though, in pointing out that there is a historical exception to that which occurred in the generation immediately following World War II. The war had unsettled the existing order. The Great Depression, followed by the many years of privation needed to fund the war, had left an enormous pent-up demand. Governments across the West attempted to show gratitude to the veterans who had largely been recruited from working class families. And they provided programs for college subsidies and home ownership, and all of these helped to jumpstart a growing middle class at that time. With a combination of increasing working class education and a successful spike in the trade union movement, the period between 1945 and 1981, according to Piketty's research, represented a historical anomaly in which relative economic power of the middle class actually increased in relation to the owning classes of the world. Of course, in the late 70s and the early 80s, a counterattack occurred, which was led by political figures such as Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Western democracies began to assault the trade union movement and began destabilizing government by huge tax cuts for the wealthy and what we typically refer to as trickle-down economics. With a nearly monomaniacal obsession, the owning classes called regulations, they so called to eliminate them and these are what I would typically call protections for the ordinary people against the abuses of capitalism. Both parties bear some responsibility for the coddling of Wall Street. The decision to encourage unregulated capitalism led directly to the financial collapse in 2008. The decision to let traditional banks undertake the role of investment banks led directly to the collapse of 2008 and the greatest financial disaster since Herbert Hoover's depression. Specifically, Wall Street greed led to the manipulation of home sales and mortgages and the traditional American experience of saving up and qualifying for a home and a home loan became, we learned a new verb, became securitized, which meant that absent government oversight millions of non-performing mortgages were made as bundles of securities to be bought and sold by speculators. When this bubble burst in October of 2008, it was the U.S. government which came to the rescue and prevented most of the big banks from failing. That isn't capitalism. At the same time, they used the U.S. Treasury to save the U.S. auto industry from failing. Now that's a policy decision I supported, but that isn't capitalism. Capitalism would have said a free market will allow the banks to fail and the auto industry to fail. But people across the political spectrum supported this intervention in the market. No one who engaged in this systematic defrauding of the American economy and the American taxpayer was prosecuted. This policy has been identified as the Holder Rule, after then Attorney General Eric Holder, in which bureaucrats in the Department of Justice would evaluate the consequences of indicting companies and company management as it would otherwise percolate within the economy. 
and they made a judgment that civil penalties would be sufficient to punish these companies for the manipulation that had led to the 2008 collapse. Now this needs to be looked at contextually. At this same time, this same Department of Justice, and the ones that preceded it and the ones that have succeeded it, was prosecuting countless poor people for misbehavior, collection with drugs, were put in jail because they couldn't afford fines and fees. And not one plutocrat was brought before the Court of Justice to answer for this systematic defrauding of the American public and the American taxpayer in this enormous white-collar crime. So again, I ask this question. Is America a capitalist country in 2018? The Koch brothers and their fellow oligarchs would argue that the free market is as much a part of nature as gravity and quantum physics. Now, of course, we know that's bollocks. I was about to use a more colorful noun, but I censored. The market as it exists in America is a construct of legislation, court rulings, and bureaucratic orders. The government determines how contracts are made and how they are enforced and how debt is paid or not paid and how it's discharged in bankruptcy. How property is owned and conveyed and subject to condemnation for purposes. Does anyone in this room doubt that this artificial market is created as a direct result of the corporate masters who require that the market be defined in a certain way? We know the great menace to democracy is the corrosive influence of campaign contributions. The laws of this country are molded and shaped for the benefit of the owning classes in disregard of the needs of the working class, and they are molded by the millions upon millions of dollars going to the lawyers and lobbyists of the owning classes of this country. The Republicans claim to be the party of straight states' rights, until, of course, they don't like what the states do. For example, California, a few years ago, passed a law that said that credit card issuers in California could not put language in their contracts which allowed their users to sue MasterCard or Visa, etc., in class actions. MasterCard and Visa sued about this. It went to the United States Supreme Court, and the Republican Supreme Court said that that was an unconstitutional impairment of the right of contract, and that if users signed the contract, that they could no longer afford themselves with the class action protection. The Consumer Protection Bureau, under the guidance of Richard Cordray, responded to that Supreme Court ruling, and they enunciated a rule for the whole country in which people would have the benefit of class action. The Republican Congress overturned that rule. Now, why did they do that? It's because they are more beholden to Visa and MasterCard than they are to the needs of the American people. Let me give you another example. We have now become flush with oil because of the production developments of hydraulic fracking. And we repealed the law against being able, unable to export petroleum that had been on the books since the Nixon administration. Notwithstanding that, we continue to tap the Treasury to give corn subsidies throughout the Midwest in order to create more corn, in part to create ethanol. We also try to create more corn in order to feed the cows who would be healthier if they ate grass, but now on a corn diet have to supplement it with antibiotics. Why do we do that? Not because it's good policy, but because the behemoths of Archer Daniel Midland and other agricultural power brokers say that that's what we do. We're not having legislation for the good of the people. We're having legislation for the good of the owning classes of this country. We have not been a capitalist country in my lifetime. We control the cost of interest through the regulations of the Federal Reserve. We control the cost of labor <coughs> by restricting immigration and by assaults on organized labor. We control who can be relieved of debt through a very pro-creditor <coughs> bankruptcy code. And when big business gets into trouble, we crank up the federal printing press and produce whatever money we need to come bail it out when the 
big shots in Washington decide this or that company is simply too big to fail. So why did we let this happen? The Democrats at their high point as a party of working people were led by Franklin Roosevelt. His policies, in my view, saved democracy mm -hmm. from either communism or fascism mm -hmm. by injecting a healthy dose of democratic socialism to save this country. The American dream, which came into being by the end of his presidency, was short-lived. But millions of Americans owned a home, had dependable employment, and genuinely expected that their children would do better than they had. The next great leap forward took place in this country under Lyndon Johnson when he tried to make the American dream available to a broader and more diverse part of the country, mm -hmm. including people of color and women. So why has this country just gone to hell in the last 40 years? The Democrats have quit emphasizing the economic issues which unified the working class people of all races and genders. It has become more a grievance party, and instead of railing against the injustices of a rigged economy, we seek to emphasize our differences and seek piecemeal remedies rather than economic justice. In my view, the Republicans do an even greater disservice. Instead of presenting policies of economic justice, they essentially emphasize religion and hyper-patriotism as a substitute for addressing things which actually affect people's lives, such as jobs and pensions and health care. Instead, they talk about the national anthem and flag burning and abortion. My friends, I promise you that whenever a politician drapes himself in the flag and talks about valor and honor in the United States, that is a metaphor and a substitute for the bank vault. That is really what is going on there. If we on the left want to win, I submit to you we have got to start talking to the Trump voter. I keep hearing that many of them feel disrespected and talked down to. They believe that there is an elitist view that we perceive them as some sort of strange character best characterized as clutching a shotgun, a Bible, and a bottle of Oxycontin. And the truth is that millions of them are hardworking Americans who have been sacrificed by both political parties' commitment to globalism and a failure to protect the American worker. <clears throat> yes, there are Trump voters who are more correctly described as being racist, sexist, homophobic, or xenophobic. And if that's what brought them to the Trump dance, they're probably beyond the reach of people such as us. But there are far more ordinary Americans who know that the political system is beholden to corporate interests and not to the individual lives of our people. They know that they have become disposable cannon fodder for both political parties. We can get them back with the appropriate message. We can protect democracy with a fairly straightforward plan. We can reduce health care in this country by guaranteeing it as a right to every American. We can pay for American infrastructure, which will improve the quality of life for all of us in this country, will create enormous employment opportunities, and we can pay for it by reducing the dependence on American empire, which we do not need. We can guarantee that every American seeking higher education may do so without a lifetime burden of debt. And we must every day declare our commitment to saving this planet by various means, but partly by guaranteeing full employment by investing in sustainable and renewable energy. And finally, if we want to save democracy, we have got to fund our campaigns publicly. We certainly must always permit free dissent and disagreement, and people must always be welcome to encourage free market versus whatever market intervention, etc. And to do that would require either an amendment 
to the U.S. Constitution or generous appointments to the United States Supreme Court. But until we get the pernicious effects of big money out of crafting policy, we will continue to risk the very existence of our democracy. I read that a lot of millennials are no longer especially committed to the concept that democracy is the best way to govern ourselves. Why should they really think differently? Do any of us in this room really believe that we have a system of one person, one vote? We know that we have a corrupt political system in which the Koch brothers and the Mercers and their fellow plutocrats are buying this government. And the public policy is being shaped according to their needs and not according to the public needs. We as grassroots activists may have only a couple of more election cycles in which to try to staunch the hemorrhaging of our freedoms. Our American democracy is in peril. And the only thing that will save it is the adoption of a platform of democratic socialism. And once again, allow the government to serve the people and not to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the billionaire class. I thank you for your time.